Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence. We just give you praise that you are good. We thank you. We ask your blessing to be over us today in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk about what God says about success, and we're going to be looking at Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and I've read this a lot, and every time I read it, God gives me new insight. I don't know about you, but I need the wisdom of God in this hour. I mean, I need the wisdom of God more than I've ever needed it in my entire life. I've been serving God for a long time, but I need him more now than I did a year ago. And I think God puts us in that position on purpose because he doesn't want us to get dull or get complacent. There is no room to be complacent in this day. There is no time to be complacent. So this, the children of Israel were getting ready to go into the promised land. Now remember this, that the kingdom of God is built on promises. Everything God did, he did with a covenant. A covenant is a, it's a promise or a set of promises that God says he's going to do. So everything God does, the communion, that's why we take communion. You know why we take the communion? Because we're in covenant with the Lord and it reminds us that we are in covenant with God. It reminds us to obey him, but also reminds us that God has promised to take care of us. And God will take care of us. So God puts a grace upon your life that's an empowerment so that you can do what he's calling you to do at that very moment. Grace is continuous and it's for the moment. It's an empowerment. So we need to focus on what God, on the grace that God has for us. What are you calling us to do? And we need to walk in that grace, receive that grace. So we're going to look at Joshua. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. So Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 says, Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. And therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm going to them, to the sons of Israel. Moses is called the servant of the Lord three times in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, verse 13, and verse 15. He's called the servant of the Lord 13 times elsewhere in the book of Joshua. I think the first rule of success is that we need to understand that we are God's servants first. Our first responsibility is we are God's servants. Now, we're not everybody's servant. We're God's servant. So in other words, if God tells you to do something, do it. But if God doesn't tell you to do it, then it's optional. Over the years, I've had a lot of people tell me the things that I should be doing as a pastor. Well, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, you need to do that. Well, you know what? I need to do what God tells me to do. Because God, I'm God's servant first. God comes first. I have to do what God says first. That's why the burnout rate among pastors is so great because they get pushed by people who don't understand the word of God. You know, well, let's just see how much we can get out of this pastor. And especially in, in, in 2020, pastors left the ministry at a record level.
Well, I have to understand that I'm God's servant first. So I've got to do what God tells me to do. No matter what, I've, I've, I've just got to do it. So what, you know what? God's called me here. So I'm not leaving. Why? Because I'm, I'm God's servant. And there's a, it's a powerful principle, the concept of servant. Jesus made an incredible statement. Turn to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. 2020. I didn't say that. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down, making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? This was a classic example of an uh, overreaching mother. What do they call it? A, a helicopter mother, you know, hovering over constantly. He said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit on your right hand and one on your left. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you were asking. You know, this is another principle. This is just a side little note I'm going to just throw at you right here. Unto much is given, much is required. The more God entrusts us with, the more he requires so maybe if you're in a season where God's not entrusting you with a whole lot, maybe you need to endure that season. Because you may enter into a busier season where you're thinking, Lord have mercy, I can't handle all this. He said, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And we know that all of the disciples, except John, his history says were martyred for the faith. We, we know for sure that Peter was killed and Jesus prophesied that he, of, of his death. And the story goes that Peter said, don't hang me right side up. I, I'm, I'm not worthy to be crucified like Jesus. Hang me upside down. Now, that's just a history. We don't know if that's absolutely true. But we know, we can pretty much say that they all were martyred for the faith. That's why the new Jerusalem, there's 12 foundation stones that are going to have their names on it. Why? Because they paid a big price. So don't look at somebody else and envy what they have. You may not want what they have. You may not want the responsibility unless it's what God has called you to do. And then if God calls you to do it, you can do it. But I've learned to be content, not complacent, but to be content with a godly contentment with what God has entrusted me with. And you know what? God's taking care of me. I, it is, all I can say is that it is, when I really think about it, it is miraculous what God has done in my life and how God has taken care of me, how God has taken care of my children and provided for everything that we need. So I know God's not going to quit in the future. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Judging God's past performance, I can expect nothing but good in the future. <laughs> So he says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right hand and my left, this is not mine to give. It is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. They got really upset. You know, we don't think about it, but the disciples had a lot of arguments. I mean, you can read through the scripture, you know. Well, this was one of them. They were men with egos and feelings just like we all have, right? We all have emotions and sometimes they get in the way of what we need to be doing or how we need to be thinking. So we've got to put those things in check. That's why Paul said, I die daily. But Jesus called unto himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great men exercised authority over them. It is not this way among 
you. When God puts you in a position of authority, it is not to lord over people. It is to serve. It's a totally different attitude. But you know what? That's a winning concept. Everybody likes Chick-fil-A, right? Well, their whole organization is built upon this concept. We came back late from a football game one night, and Andrew was really hungry, and we went to one place. They were closed, and so finally we got to Madison, and we pulled into Chick-fil-A, and we were the last ones. As soon as they took our order, they said, close. I was like, boy, Andrew, God was watching out for you. All right, so he got a chicken sandwich. Well, he didn't think about anything else. Well, we started to pull around the drive, the drive through. He said, oh, gee, I should have I, I gotten fries and a, a diet lemonade. And I said, well, let's, you know, and skip. My father-in-law was like, well, let's just ask him at the window. I said, they're not going to do that. Well, we got to the window. They said, oh, we would like fries and a diet lemonade added with that. Nobody blink an eye. Within two minutes, out came the fries, out came the lemonade. See, that's servant. Whatever I can do, let me do. Well, I tell you one thing. Uh, Backyard Burger is next to Chick-fil-A, and Chick-fil-A's drive through is always packed. Uh, Backyard Burger, I, I'm not sure how they stay in business. <laughs> yeah, because you work there, right? That's right. Trey knows all the inner workings of Backyard Burger. Right? <laughs> Let's do an expose on it, right? <laughs> So there's a power when we understand that. Whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So we're servants. But again, remember, our accountability is to God first. So if you have a servant's gift, just make sure you're doing things that God wants you to do. And you're not just wearing yourself out because you can do it really quick. Okay, God, what do you want me to do? And I'll do what you want me to do. See, would the psalmist say, I delight to do your will, O Lord. It is not grievous to me. We used to, we used to sing a song about it. Remember that song? I delight to do thy will. Years ago, back in the late 70s, we sang a song. All these songs in Scripture, I can honestly say, they're stuck in my head forever. Whether I like it or not. But the, but the Scripture is, is, is stuck in my head forever. So to be a servant, that's the first rule of godly success. God, I'm your servant. I work for you. I may get paid through a business, but I work for you. My provision comes from you. And when we understand that, then it releases us from the dependency upon man and the fear of man. And we realize that, hey, God's the one who's really pulling the strings and really taking care of me. So I'm going to trust you and just do the best job that I can. All right, let's, let's go on. Moses, my servant, is dead. Arise, cross over this Jordan. Number th- uh, second thing comes from verse three. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given to you, just as I spoke to Moses. I believe that speaks of diligence. You've got to put forth some effort. I mean, we often think about that, but they walked around Jericho seven times. That took a lot of faith, but it took a lot of effort, too, to walk around that city seven times. Remember, uh, Katie and I were here one day. We were just praying, and Katie said, oh, I just feel like we we, we need to walk around the church seven times and pray. I said, okay. You know, I thought, well, that's no big deal. Well, you know what? After the third time, I was tired of walking around this church. I was like, come on. It's okay, right? It's like, oh, let's do it seven times. It took some effort. Even though you don't think it's a big deal, you, you walk around this church in the heat seven times, okay, and pray. Just the, the seven time around challenge, I'll give you that. So in, in other words, every place where the sole of your foot treads, you're going to have to put forth some effort. I believe this speaks of diligence. And diligence is something... We'll turn to Proverbs chapter 12, verse 27. Proverbs 12, verse 27. 
Proverbs 12, verse 27. This is a great scripture. You need to just keep under it in your mind. A lazy man does not roast his prey, but the precious possession of a man is diligence. In other words, diligence is something that you possess, and it's, only, it's, only, it's something that only you can do. It's a precious possession. Diligence. In the Hebrew, this word diligence means sharpness. Sharpness. Keep yourself sharp. Keep yourself sharp in God's word first. Remember, you're God's servant first. Keep yourself sharp in the word of God. I want you to turn to Ecclesiastes 10, verse 10. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 10. It says this, If the axe is dull and he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. Wisdom has the advantage of giving success. Keep yourself sharp in the word of God. Your wisdom and your knowledge and your expertise will grow as you keep yourself sharp in the Word of God. There was a man who came to faith during a Rodney Howard Brown meeting not too long ago. I was watching, and he was a lawyer. He was an intellectual, and he said, you know, God was calling me to really study and read the Word, and I said, well, God, I'm a Lawyer, I don't have to do that. But he learned that after he, be, after he intensely studied the word and he got into the word on a daily basis, that his law practice improved. He had more wisdom, he had more insight. Why? Because he kept his mind sharp. He kept his spirit sharp. Keep your mind sharp in the word of God. There's a power when you read it and you apply it and you meditate on it. There's a power. And we're going to talk about meditation last. That's going to be the last thing we're going to talk about. Keep yourself sharp. If the axe is dull, you must exert more strength. Why work harder than you have to? Keep yourself sharp in, in the Word of God. Wisdom will make your life easier. Wisdom. Because you won't make as many mistakes. Turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Paul gives some advice. But look, uh, let's just read verse 11 because we're, we're going to go to, to Hebrews 2. Re verse 11 says, Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Not lagging behind in diligence diligence, to be conscientious, to persevere, be diligent. Keep on doing what God tells you to do. Here are some of the uh, synonyms of diligence, meticulous, thoroughness, attentiveness, carefulness, and persistence. Be meticulous with God's word. Be thorough with God's word. Be attentive. Be careful. And be persistent to keep doing God's word. Even when you don't see the results, just keep doing it. Diligence. Diligence. Many people start off running well, but they don't keep it up. And that's really what separates the men from the boys. Keep up the intensity of seeking God. It's important. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 11 says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Peter says, Apply all diligence to your faith. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5, Apply all diligence. Be persistent. Be conscientious. Be thorough. Be meticulous. Don't read the Bible too fast. Read it and think about it. What does it say? What is God trying to tell you? You will find wisdom and it, it, it will spill over into every area of your life. If you're a business person... Your biggest weapon is the Word of God. Raising your kids, 
the Word of God. In your marriage, the Word of God. If all husbands would love their wives as Christ loved the church, marital problems and divorces would drop significantly. It's a, it's a simple phrase. Wives submit. But a wife can only truly submit when a husband does his part. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Does God ever give up on you? No. Well, then don't give up on, on your wife. Apply godly principles to your life. So diligence, every place where the sole of your foot treads. So we're God's servants. Be diligent. Keep up the intensity of serving the Lord. Make it a daily habit to pray and read the Bible. I'm telling you right now, I can't live without it right now. I mean, I never could, but God's put me in a place where I realize I cannot live without it. And this leads us to the next one. Joshua 1, chapter 6, be strong and courageous. God tells this to Joshua three times. That word strong and courageous, they sort of have similar meaning, so I'm just going to go over a couple of things. The first thing that courageous means is to make strong. In, in other words, what wasn't strong, God wants to make you strong. See, and I firmly believe that's what God is doing to me. He's, he, he's putting courage within me where I didn't have courage, even though I look at it like a trial, it's like God is making me stronger. He's giving me courage within my heart to see that he can do it, that he can take care of me, that I am going to make it. See, that's courage, see? So God, God is building that courage within me. So if you feel like you're going through something that, that's, that's difficult, God's just making you strong. He's showing you that he's going to take care of it. Courage. Be strong and courageous. Another thing that, that means is to take hold. Take hold. This is a day to take hold of God's word and to say, no, God, you said. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 18. He's talking about wisdom, which is, which is the word of God. He says, she is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. We've got to take hold. There has to be a response We've got to take hold of it, hold on to it tightly, and not let it go. God, no matter what I see, I'm taking hold of your word, and I'm not letting it go. Remember this, the devil is a liar, and he will try to steal your faith. He will point to things in your life and make you doubt God's word. You know he does it. We don't need to give in to it. Take Hold. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. Wow. Why are we ever surprised when we have to fight? Sometimes I am surprised, but I'm like, you know what? It, it, it's the fight of good faith. God is, fat, God is making us into warriors. There is a thousand year period that we are I know it sounds crazy but there's a thousand year period where we're, we are going to rule and reign with Christ how we respond how we behave in this life will determine our status in that ruling and reigning because it's going to happen sooner rather than later I believe I'm not saying tomorrow I'm just saying Jesus is coming back and one day, we're going to be at that time, and we're just going to be like, wow. Wow. And we're going to understand everything. We're going to understand everything that we went through. 
We're going to understand why this happened. I mean, we're, just, we're just going to know. All of a sudden, I believe, we're just going to know everything. That's what Paul said. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be like him. We shall be changed. And in a moment, we're going to know everything. But right now, it's faith. Right now, we're walking it out. Right now, we don't see everything. But I promise you, in a moment, we're going to be changed. And we're going to know everything. And it's all going to make sense. So let's just keep going and say, God, you are faithful. You are faithful. This life is such, it, look, we know it here more than we've ever known it, right? This life is a vapor. We're all grass. I'm talking about our physical bodies, this earthly life. Not, uh, not our souls, not our spirits, obviously. So we need to live with wisdom. We need to live pursuing God. We need to live knowing that God, want, God wants you to be successful in whatever he's called you to be. But we can't do that if we're looking at everybody else and, lo- and desiring somebody else's life, right? I mean, that's, that's what the whole thing about our society, we're so enamored with stars, right? With, I mean, but why? Because we want what they have. Well, I'll tell you right now, I don't want what any celebrity has. Because a lot of actors, you get them off script and they're just talking and you're like, wow, you're pretty dumb. (laughs) You don't know what you're talking about. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. Take hold. Take hold. Grab on. Don't let go. Don't let go. See, that's the kind of faith that my mother has. And I believe that she passed it on to me. Dad, you have faith too. But mom's just, y'all know mom, you know He's tough. (laughs) It's tough when it comes to to saying, yes, I'm I'm gonna believe God. So I receive that mom from you. Hebrews chapter six, verse eighteen says, So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. Take hold. And this take, taking hold is not just taking hold in a time of desperation, but it's taking hold when things are great because Paul goes on in 2 Timothy chapter 6 and he gives some instructions for the rich. And my prayer is that this will apply to everybody here. <laughs> as long as you pay your tithe. No, just kidding. Like, like, like dad always would say. But he's talking about the rich, and he says the same thing. So that they may take hold in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 19, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. So whether you're in feast, whether everything's going great, or, or, you're, or you're in the middle of a fight, we're supposed to just take hold and never let go of God. So, we're almost done here with what God says about success. First thing, we're God's servants first. Moses, my servant, is dead. He was called that about 15 times in the book of Joshua. Moses, my servant. First Joshua, chapter 1, verse 3. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, diligence, be strong and courageous. God's going to make you strong, and you've got to take hold. And the last thing, but not least... Verse 8, he says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Well, let's go to verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success. And let's just talk about this word success and what this actual word actually means in the Scripture 
And when you look it up in the Hebrew, in this passage, this is basically what success is. It is the process of thinking through a complex arrangement of thoughts. How many of you know life is complex? Not because God can't be understood, but because we have an enemy. And we're in a time of war. And decisions have to be made. So it's the process of thinking through a complex arrangement of thoughts, resulting in a wise dealing and use of good, practical, common sense. Thereupon you will be successful. So being successful is being able to think through complex situations, complex thoughts that bombard your mind, and finding out what God says about it, and pushing forward with success because you have understanding and a wise dealing and you have good practical common sense. You know, God's very practical. How is this helping us? The Bible is real help for every day. Every day. And then he told Joshua this. He said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according. Again, be, being careful, that's the same thing as diligence, being meticulous. Be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. How many of you like the word prosperous and the word success? I, I, I like those two words. So you know what? I'm going to do what God tells me to do. I'm going to do what God tells me to do. So this word meditate means, literally means to murmur or to sort of make sounds. And how they would meditate on the scripture, they would basically say it to themselves. Now meditation is different from declaring the word of the Lord. When you declare the word of the Lord, you're praying, you're, you're, you know, you're speaking God's word. But when you meditate, it's so that you can gain understanding. So you may Say uh, one phrase over and o over again as you pray. Like, for instance, uh, how about this? Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. I'm just going to give you an example. Isaiah chapter 40. And again, I just encourage you, uh, at least once a week with your family, take out the Bible and read some scriptures and talk about what it means. That will bring life to your home. I'm telling you, it, it will bring life to your home. So here's an example. Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 29. Here's a good one to meditate on when you're not feeling very strong. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. And you can just say that to yourself and allow the Holy Spirit to touch you. He gives strength to the weary. What, he gives strength to the weary. What, what does that mean? He gives strength to the weary. Meaning if you're tired, you're not going to stay that way. To him who lacks might, he increases power. Think about that. You feel like you lack some might? Well, guess what? God's going to increase your power. And just meditate on that and just allow the Holy Spirit to touch you and give you insight. And you'll be amazed. So I have, I'm challenged for you today. Do that at least five minutes a day. Just pick a scripture and just sort of say it over to yourself. And just say it over and over again. And you can either em, em, uh, em, emphasize different words. For like you can go, he gives strength to the weary. He gives strength to the weary. He gives strength to the weary. And you can just meditate on that word and allow God to, to touch you because there's power. I'm, I'm just, 
I always believed there was power in the Word, but it's like God's just taking me to a new level, realizing that this, this, what did Jesus say? In fact, this was, phrase was first in the book of Deuteronomy, which was God's blueprint for going into the promised land of the children of Israel. And what does it say? This is a scripture that Jesus quoted for when the devil came against him. Man, when he said, hey, if you're the son of God, because Jesus was hungry, he'd been fasting for 40 days. If you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus could have done that, obviously. And he, and he, he said, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What is that? It's this. It's this. So your sustenance, your vitality, your strength, your success proceeds out of the mouth of God. God's word. Simple, 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 but we miss it because we live in a complex world and we think we need a complex solution, but God's got a simple solution to all the complexity that is in our life. See, the devil is, is the author of confusion. So he, he just wants to confuse. But God, truth is understandable. God wants to be known. His invisible attributes are clearly seen through what is made. That, that, that's what Paul said in Romans Chapter 1, God wants to be known and he can be known. So, you are ready for success. Know you're God's servant. Be diligent. Allow God to make you strong. Take hold. And Meditate on the word of God. When you meditate, this is what God says, then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. So it's something that you've got to do. But when you meditate, you will be prosperous and you will have good success. So I just want to encourage you. This week, if you have kids in your home or with your wife or if you live by yourself, get out the word of God and read it, and talk about it. And if you live by yourself, call somebody on the phone <laughs> and talk about it, or invite somebody over. <laughs> because this is what is going to sustain us. Amen? So God is good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your presence today. Father, that we want, Father, we want to be successful. We want to be successful, Father. We we want your blessing, Father. We want to do what you've called us to do in this hour, Father. So we thank you, Father, you've given us all that we need to do that. So we give you praise, Father. We give you praise, Father. So I'm just going to pray the prayer of blessing over you today. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord... Bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and I then will bless them. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. God bless you.